There's nothing like the need of catching a plane that will make a fellow stop on time. And so I'll have to do that today, so... Uh, but at any rate, while you'll be the benefactor of that, I'm sure, by my doing so. But I've been here since 9 o'clock on Monday morning, and I've thoroughly enjoyed this lectureship and enjoyed the fellowship with so many of you. One of the things I enjoy most about a lectureship, I think, is not just listening to the various speeches that are delivered, but also to see old friends again and to have the association with other men who are preachers of the gospel, too. And I always go away with just a little bit of a feeling that I've been a little closer to heaven because I've been with uh, men who love the Lord so very, very much and are doing so much to try to promote the cause of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Brother Whitten wrote me some months ago to ask me about speaking on the program. He left it up to me as to deciding on what to say, or at least to choosing a subject. And I suggested to Brother Whitten at that time that uh, what had been going on in my mind a long, long time is the thought of unity in the Restoration Movement. And it appeared to me that somewhere, someplace down the line, that all of us ought to give a moment of thought to some of the basic uh, principles that are involved or were involved in the Restoration Movement in unity. And there's a passage of Scripture over in the 17th chapter of John, which is familiar to us all, in the great uh, prayer that Jesus uttered. The Lord said, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And I'm sure that those of you that have been preaching the gospel for any length of time have found occasion to preach on that particular verse many, many times. Brother T.B. Larimore, about 50 years after he had started preaching, uh, wrote a reminiscence of his first sermon, and he said it was based on this text. And he said he preached it everywhere he went. He made rather copious notes on it. And when he got up to deliver his sermon, he said on one occasion, why he had misplaced his notes, and he said he was a young preacher just getting started, and it scared him to death, and he thought he was going to have to sit down until he got fidgeting around through his New Testament, and he found the notes over in another place that he had misplaced them. But at any rate, he said after all of these years, as I've thought about it, he said, I don't regret at all having spoken on the matter of Christian unity as my first lesson. And the first sermons that I ever delivered, he said, were based then on this particular thought. Well, the old pioneers, I suppose, preach more on this one text more often than they did on any other single passage. And by it, of course, they were sort of reminiscing on the point that the Restoration Movement had unity as the very heart and soul of its message. In the 1820s, when Alexander Campbell began the Christian Baptists, Campbell, of course, announced that the purpose of this publication and of what they were trying to do was simply to bring about Christian unity. And I think it's important for us to keep this in mind that the goal of the Restoration Movement was unity. On the other hand, the method by which that would be achieved would simply be by restoration of New Testament Christianity. As Campbell reasoned it out, we're not going to have unity by dropping my theories or your theories or somebody else's and all coming to some person. But if all of us could drop our own and then each one of us could come to the Word of God and follow exactly the divine pattern as was brought to our attention a while ago, it would be then that we could have unity that would exist. But unity is achieved only when we drop all of our particular opinions and then we desire to come back and to follow the Word of God and do what it says for us to do. Well, with this in mind, therefore, the goal of the Restoration Movement was Christian unity. And the method by which that goal would be achieved, as Campbell saw it, was simply the restoration of the Christianity of the New Testament. Now then, a strange enigma has taken place, it appears to me, as we look in an overview of the entire Restoration Movement that it seems a little bit inconceivable that a movement that started out to bring about Christian unity has in reality found so little of it. That the fact of the business is that over the years, from almost the very beginning, there have been elements within the church that have tended to put pressure points here and there, that have tended, therefore, to bring division about. 
In the early days, Martin W. Stone and Alexander Campbell had a difference in 1839 over the choosing of a name for the people of the Restoration Movement. And Alexander Campbell suddenly announced in the Millennial Harbinger that he favored calling these people the disciple. And he said we should be called the disciples of Christ is our name. Martin W. Stone, when he was sitting down in Jacksonville, Illinois, and read the article, said that he came away amazed because he didn't believe that Alexander Campbell would ever do that. We have talked so very many times about it, and Campbell knows my conviction that the name Christian is the only divine name and the only one we have any right to wear. And so he and Campbell entered into a correspondence about it. And in congregations scattered all over the frontier, brethren were somewhat upset about what Alexander Campbell had said he was going to do in the selection of a name for the, for the people. Over in a little congregation in Bourbon County, Kentucky, uh, the old Antioch congregation that uh, had been established just about 15 years before that, as a matter of fact, but would still exist. The old Antioch congregation, John Allen Gano, was holding a meeting. Along with him was T.M. Allen. And so they were preaching twice every day and eating a lot of fried chicken here in the summertime on the, on the grounds as they went along. But as they talked about it, Brother Gano was particularly upset about it. And Gano got up and he preached a sermon about it, and he said this should never have happened. And let us all, therefore, he pled for the people at present in that meeting. Come on back and stand where the Bible stands on this name and other things. But Campbell may not have been fully aware of it, but at that time there was creeping into the Restoration Movement uh, something of a very significant sort of a difference. Well, five years later, Walter Scott began to take notice that Catholics were coming into the Mar American droves from, from Ireland. He published the Christian Unionists because he was uh, of the opinion uh, that Catholicism may very well take over America. And so what he began to do, therefore, was to plead for a solid basis on which all Protestant churches should have unity. And he put the disciples as one of the denominations among denominations. And he says that what is essential for us to believe is just one thing, and that is a belief in Jesus as the Son of the living God. And all of us, therefore, ought to be able to fellowship each other if we are therefore of the conviction that we can hold to this point of view. Well, there were many brethren who remembered the triumphs of Walter Scott on the Western Reserve, and who said, Scott, you didn't do it this way on the Western Reserve a few years ago. And there were people that were beginning to prick up their ears and wonder what's going on within us. But to make a long story short, brethren, of course, came to have their differences in time to come over the matters of the Missionary Society established in 1849, later on over the question of instrumental music, and then slowly there began to filter into the church a sort of a liberal theology that seemed to grow out of largely the old Missouri Christian lectureship that said that we are giving scholarship, therefore, to our brotherhood. And so out of this there developed then a sort of a scholarship that departed from the Word of God a liberal theology that found room very adequately in an ecumenical movement for all the different kinds of people, regardless of who they were, as though, uh, just as though they claimed to be Christian. The point that I'm making to you is that if we turn to the early days of the Restoration Movement, that what we inevitably discover is that it hasn't always gone so well in terms of unity, uh, that there were these strains that were constantly coming up. Well, is it any better among us today in the churches of Christ? And there was a time when we were relatively united all right, if we go back to the early days of this century. What united people was that we had in part a common enemy, and that was the digressive movement that was trying to move so many churches and people away from uh, the simple, solid basis of New Testament teaching. And our brethren seemed to draw together in a stronger bond of fellowship because there was something in common out there that stood against them, and they were determined that we shall go solidly by that which is written in the Word of God, and so they did. But as time has gone on, we have come, therefore, around to where people have turned the spotlight inwardly upon us within the churches of Christ. And, of course, what they have done is to find many things wrong with us in the way we do business. And so the result of it all has been, then, that we've had our problems over cooperation, for example, and over orphans' homes and over crossroads movement, as was brought out, 
and over other things that have come up in the last number of years. And all of this, it appears to me, leads us around to raise the question, what sort of an answer is there to the matter of Christian unity and how do we get it? Well, I want to suggest to you very quickly, I don't have all of the answers, and I'm not suggesting that any knowledge of the Restoration Movement uh, is going to come along and say, well, here it is, a very simplistic thing, because the causes and the elements that are involved in it are altogether too complex for that. What I do want to do is to suggest to you some things that appear to me as uh, things on the whole topic that might be very well for us to very briefly uh, take into consideration, and that's what I want to do in the short time that I have to speak to you then this morning. For one thing, I think when we take the matter of Christian unity under consideration, one thing we have to realize is that there have always been and there always will be some elements of differences among individual Christians. I don't know of any way to avoid that. In part, I suppose it's absolutely human nature for it to be this way. But Alexander Campbell took it into consideration. Campbell, you know, had the slogan that in matters of faith there should be unity, and in matters of opinion there should be liberty, but in all things there should be love. Well, now, the point of it is that with Campbell, a matter of faith was that which was revealed in the Word of God where it's a matter that either we accept it or reject it. We accept it if we've got enough faith in God to do so. And if we reject it, it's simply because we, don't, we do not believe in it or believe in what God has said. In all matters of faith, therefore, we are duty-bound because God has said it, therefore accept it as an element of truth, and accepting it as a truth to act upon it as far as it is possible for us to do so. Campbell said on this matter there must always be unity, and there can be nothing else there. On the other hand, in a matter of opinion, therefore, Campbell said, that opinions are those cognitions which we possess, uh, which we do on the basis of an inadequate amount of information. We don't altogether know why did the Apostle Paul, for example, or, uh, have a thorn in the flesh, and exactly what was it? Well, we know he had one. It's a matter of faith that we accept it. On the other hand, exactly what it was, Paul never revealed it to us at all. So it's a matter, therefore, of, a, of opinion, and we allow each one, said Alexander Campbell, to have his own opinion. Whether our opinions are concerned, every person has a perfect right to his own opinion, as long as he does not try to say to me, you've got to accept my opinion or else you're unsound. I have no right to do that with anybody else, and they have no right to do it to me. So it's a matter of a, of a liberty which we possess. This was the idea in the Restoration Movement as Campbell was trying to lay down this platform. But now when we say all of that, there's a problem, of course, involved. We come along and we say, all right, here's a matter of faith and over here's a matter of an opinion. But the real problem, historically speaking, has been who decides on what's what. In other words, who's going to come along and say, okay, this is an element of faith and over here's an element of, of opinion and let's keep them, therefore, categorized right there. Well, that's a problem. When instrumental music came along, there were so many that said, well, whether or not you believe in instrumental music, it's a matter of opinion, that's all. And if you want to think it's wrong, that's your opinion, and if you want to think it's right, that's your opinion. Well, the practicality of it didn't work that simply, because if I go to services and I worship and I have people there who've got their opinion that an instrument is all right, I have to go along with their opinion or get out because they put it in there to be used, you see. Well, so it made, from a practical point of view, a very difficult problem. But it still comes on down, historically speaking, to a problem with us. What is a matter but opinion, and who decides on which, what it is? Well, we have no synods in the churches of Christ. We have nobody, therefore, to say to us, now here is something that all of you people must believe if you're going to be members of the church and that all of you as preachers must preach if you're going to be members of the church, because our synod has spoken, and therefore this mandate has been laid down that this is a matter of faith and this is something else over here that's a matter of an opinion. Nobody is there to tell us what is a matter of faith and what is a matter of opinion. So it is then that this is one of the problems that we have had as far as, as the history of things are concerned. Well, on the other hand, someone raised the question, well, if that's been the case, therefore, why don't we go to work and draw up a creed, and why don't we just say that a creed is the answer to it? And so we can all look over there, and it can tell us very quickly 
what we can believe and what we cannot believe. Well, the problem with all of that is, in the first place, it wouldn't be right because a creed is a human invention instead of an exact duplicate of the Word of God. But on the other hand, as far as a creed is concerned, the sad fact of the business is creeds haven't done very much as far as denominations are concerned. You look at the denominational story of almost every one of them, and they are badly, hopelessly, bitterly divided people. No church in existence is more divided than the Presbyterian Church, yet they have their ecumenical uh, councils, they have their creed books, they have their synods, they have all of the denominational machinery there, but that hasn't brought them unity. They're a badly divided group of people. And right now, within the Presbyterian Church, there's strong moves to modernize the Westminster Confession of Faith, and some of them are advocating an overthrow of it. Well, do you think the Baptists who have a creed that they're in any better shape? And there's no group of people in the world that's more badly divided than the Baptists are. Well, the having of a creed doesn't guarantee that there's going to be unity. Having all the denominational machinery doesn't advocate that there's going to be one. And about the time we get the idea that something is wrong with us, that we have divisions among us and that all these others have it so nicely, that's just an idle dream. It doesn't work that way. And the fact of the business is then that having a creed or having all the denominational machinery is not that which conforms to the teaching of the Word of God. But nevertheless, these thoughts were there as far as the Restoration Movement was concerned. Now, in later years, there's been a, an idea that many people have thought may answer very well the problem. And this is becoming right now, within the last months, to the forefront, it appears to me, in some of the things that I've read in our brotherhood. As you know, as some of you may be aware, in the study of religious history, there has been a, um, a thought that has been developed by Richard Niebuhr of Yale University some years back. And Niebuhr's idea of it was that, we, that religious people have all been influenced by simply economic and political and social and psychological factors in any given age. In other words, it's not really that we come along and we can say that this is what the Bible says or it doesn't say. That what the Bible says, it says because we have been conditioned to it in terms of our economic and social and political ideas, that these have worked on us on the inside. And they tell us what the Bible itself uh, says, and so we simply reflect the presence of these in our own individual self. Forty years ago, I was reading articles in the old Christian evangelist by one of my teachers, Dr. Frederick W. Kirshner. And Kirshner was a very good friend, as, but he's an old man. He was blind in those days, and I learned a lot from just sitting at his feet. But he had a column that appeared in the Christian Evangelist, and one of those columns he simply pointed out that the reason that some people have objected to instrumental music goes back historically to the days around the uh, Civil War. And he said in those days, he said particularly in the South where there was so much poverty, uh, people didn't have any money to build church buildings, and they didn't have any money to buy organs. And so what they did was to make a virtue out of their economic depravity, and so they taught, therefore, that, a, that an organ was altogether an unscriptural thing to have. Well, what makes an organ unscriptural? Well, by, uh, by Kirshner's point of view, and he was a very prominent disciple leader back in those days, Kirshner was simply saying that we read into what the Bible says that which is in our own economic or social or psychological factor. And so this idea has been promoted very, very generally among the disciples of Christ. Well, if that's all there is to it, if instrumental music is wrong only because of economic factors that have been involved in it, then as far as I'm concerned, there's no use to trouble ourselves in about arguing about it one way or the other. Because if it's altogether an economic or a political or a psychological or a social factor, that's really not of any consequence to me individually. What is of importance, of course, is what the Bible teaches on this particular matter. But it's one of those points of view that is slowly, it appears to me sometimes, uh, creeping in among us today. That these things like this are not particularly wrong. We've had our forefathers who said they're wrong because of their own economic and social condition. But that's as far as the Bible teaching that. The Bible taught it only insofar as they saw it 
growing out of their particular condition, you see. Well, another thing it appears to me, and things on which I've reflected considerably in this matter of, of you Christian unity, is a matter of leadership. Not long ago, I had a letter from a young man who was getting ready to write a paper to be read before some group among us. And he said, I understand you're doing some research on Brother Foy Wallace, Jr. And he said, well, I, I understand that he's the one that's fast, uh, fastened on us this anti-premillennialist point of view. In other words, uh, here we are, those of us who don't believe in premillennialism don't believe it because Brother Wallace told us we must not believe it. And therefore, we don't believe it because of Brother Wallace. In other words, we are all what we are because of the leadership that we have had at any given period of time. And the leadership, therefore, is fastened on his particular points of view. Well, this was his idea, and I wrote him back. And I said, as much as I respected and admired Brother Wallace, I'm not against premillennialism because he was against it, but only because the Bible was against it. And that's, after all, really, as far as I'm concerned, all that really matters in this business. But on the other hand, is this something that is really a factor that, that has enormous consequences? We can't get away from the fact when we go back to the early days of the Restoration Movement that Alexander Camel was a very dominant figure. But if you get the idea that back in those early days that brethren thought that anything Alexander Campbell said that we're going to go with it, that's uh, altogether an erroneous idea. When the question of slavery began to be predominant in the 1850s in America, Alexander Campbell had a point of view that he was battered back and forth by a whole lot of brethren who didn't go along with him. If you had the idea that Alexander Campbell felt like, well, everybody's going to do whatever I tell them to do, that I'm the big cheese in all this restoration movement and nobody's ever going to dispute anything that I say. If Alexander Campbell ever had that idea, he certainly had it in an illegitimate way because that was not the case at all. And so it was with the question of missionary societies as well. Alexander Campbell thought they were all right by the day uh, that they were started, but yet not everybody at all went along with Alexander Campbell. Now, that didn't mean, doesn't mean at all, that people uh, looked down on Camel or that they felt like that uh, Camel was not a man to be respected. I don't know of anybody that didn't have a profound love and respect and admiration for him. But I also know that not everybody was going to say that a thing is right because Alexander Campbell said so. But as time has gone on, our brotherhood did, uh, did of course, develop leadership. There was David Lipscomb and the Gospel Advocate, and one of the successes of the Gospel Advocate was that David Lipscomb was the editor of it, along with E.G. Sewell, for so many years, until about 1913, actually, from 1866. And during all that period of time, Brother Lipscomb uh, had a great influence, there's no question about it, on the South and the Southwest and all every place that the Gospel Advocate went. Well, by the same token, until his death in 1887, Isaac Arrett then had a kind of a conservative, but yet on the other hand, a strange combination of liberal of, of leadership on the Christian standard. And a lot of the churches, as far as the North was concerned, went along in their uh, urban situation pretty largely with what Brother Isaac Arrett would say. And yet Arrett was resisting a lot of the ultra-liberal theology that was beginning then to come up. And under J.H. Garrison, a little bit later, and the old Missouri Christian Lectureship, Garrison began to promote liberal theology and connected with a Christian evangelist were people uh, that simply said, well, the Apostle Paul tells us that well, it's wrong to have women uh, holding office in the church and women preachers, but Paul was an old bachelor, and Paul didn't like women apparently very much, and that's all there was to it. And so, therefore, Paul was influenced by his own rabbinic teachers and things of the sort. In other words, then, uh, here you have the brotherhood going off in a different direction. A solid uh, conservative position of Brother Lipscomb and the Gospel Advocate, and then a conservatism along with a certain type of liberalism by the Christian Standard and Isaac Arrett, and then, of course, an ultra-liberalism by J.H. Garrison and the Christian Evangelist. Well, in later years, of course, as we come on down into this century, we've had significant leadership. There's no question about it, and some of us that are older can well remember a lot of this. Brother Foy Wallace, Jr. was a great leader in the church, 
uh, in my estimation, in his own day, and as far as I'm concerned, the greatest pulpiteer that I've that I ever heard. Well, along with him, Brother N.B. Hardiman was a man of great, powerful leadership in the church. Brother G.C. Brewer, a great, a great preacher among us, and these men were great leaders as far as that was concerned. Well, are we going to therefore say that what we are is simply because of the leadership we've had? And that if we'd had different leadership, we would have been different things, and we would have believed different sorts of ideas uh, if that had been the point. Well, certainly not, because any discerning person is going to realize that no matter who it is that teaches anything, that ultimately in that leadership, if it's any value at all, is going to be able to say that all that is important for us to believe and adhere to is only that which is found in the Bible. And I don't read from any of these men ever that their idea was, you do what I say, but it's to gather, as Brother G.K. said yesterday, let's all of us do to gather what it is that God's Word tells us to do. And let that Word, therefore, always at all times be our guide. But today, it seems to me, as I view it at any rate, that we're in a situation in the church when we don't have the strong leadership that we had a few years ago. And maybe on the other hand, that's, uh, that's natural because I think our nation has the same thing. We don't have the strong leadership in the last few years that we had uh, just a few years ago. Maybe it's the time in which we live. I think that's got a lot to do with it, but I don't know all the answers to it. The point of it is that without strong leadership, a political party doesn't do very much. Without strong leadership, labor parties don't do anything. Anytime people begin to say, let's get along without strong leadership, that they do us more harm and they do good, then what you have is that in every aspect of life, it's political, it's economic, it's religious, and every other aspect of life falls apart. It takes leadership. There isn't any question at all about it. But a discerning leadership in the church of the Lord is going to always pull our attention back to the Scripture. And then I want to suggest also, as I reflect on the matter of Christian unity, but sometimes there is a lack of spiritual qualities that may be at fault in some of our problems. And nobody can do very much about that except we do it ourselves. And I mean by that to say that sometimes we are torn apart by internal jealousies. And that is we're preachers are jealous of other preachers or we're jealous of one elder or jealous of another or somewhere or other it crops up consistently. And this lack of spiritual growth and spiritual development, and no question but what it has at times and places in every age of the history of the church, has been there to cause uh, some, some of our problems. And the problem isn't the Word of God, it's the fact that we don't follow the Word of God. In other words, the internal spiritual qualities that we ought to have are qualities that are simply not there with us. And then I've noticed sometimes in my own observations that Many times there's been such an attitude of a strong will to always rule. I will have my way or else. And that sort of a thing is not a Christian quality at all. It's always with us and ought to be. A, a matter of being objective enough that we can say, now whatever it is, uh, that is right in the eyes of God. And that's all that is, uh, that is important. I remember one cute little old lady that I had in a class some years ago and Sometimes she'd get off on a wild scheme, and we'd be talking about some passage in the Scripture, and she'd go off into the wild blue yonder on some idea. And I would say to her, now, Sister Ellis, uh, here's what we need to look at. Here's what the Bible says. And I've seen the pert little old lady just sit up and fold her hands very strongly, and she'd say, if that's what the Bible says, then I'm wrong, and I shut up, so... That's a pretty good attitude for most of us to take. If this is what the Bible says, then that's a pretty good spirit for all of us to have. I've noticed also that sometimes our lack of spirituality is found in our consistent spirit of fault-finding. And fault-finding is needed sometimes. There are times when it has to be done. It ought to be done. But by the same token, a lot of times we're in a negative mood on about everything. Somebody suggests we ought to do mission work. We decide, no, we don't want to do that, particularly if so-and-so says we ought to. And so then we have this sort of a, of a lack of uh, spirituality here. There's also an attitude of a lack of, on our part of making a spiritual life very important with us. 
that each one of us should see the need of walking close to God. And on a daily basis of taking time somewhere in the day to set aside that we can read his scripture, meditate on his word, have the moments in our day when we can pray to God and talk with him about all those things that we're concerned about and ask God's blessings and God's guidance upon us. And I think that we, uh, we must observe that sometimes the biggest enemy of Christian unity is what's on the inside of each one of us. And I can't do much about what's on the inside of you, and you can't do anything about what's on the inside of me. But what it amounts to is that each one of us must always keep himself under guard to see to it that we live close to God and that spiritually we're the kinds of people that God would have us all to be. I want to conclude by saying there are two or three things that as I reflect on the matter of Christian unity that are important for us always to keep before us. And one of it is that no matter what our thoughts about Christian unity are, that always the truth of God's word is important. And uh, this is showing to God the respect that is due our God, that if God has spoken, then who am I to say that God is wrong? And so that it's up to me to respect God for all that, that God has ever said. But more than that even, I suppose, you and I have a tendency to act on what we believe. Most of us do what we believe is the right thing to do. Well, if your beliefs are wrong, it's a good chance your actions are going to be wrong. And if what you believe is not true, then you may act on what you believe, and what you're acting about or what you're doing is not at all going to be the right thing to do. And that's a reason that all of us have to realize that all that we believe is found in God's Word, because if we believe it and accept it as true, then the chances are that we will act accordingly. And we'll act right if we believe uh, the truth as indeed is all to be, it ought to be lived. And finally, therefore, by way of an emphasis then in this matter, strong spiritual qualities ought to be something that's important to all Christian men and women. And I think uh, one of the strong Christian qualities ought to be to look at this matter of unity, the matter of living close to God. And the matter of striving always to be true to ourselves and true to his word and true to all that God tells us to do. And to do so with the greatest amount of closeness to God and to walk with him and be close to God. I think after all that great men spiritually uh, have always been that way. Sometimes what we see on the surface of them is something rather uh, brusque or rather, we think, not too desirable. But on the other hand, it's something that may, after all, be very much, um, uh, be very much of a spiritual quality that's in us. I went over yesterday with Brother Noble Patterson, and we visited with Brother Wallace's widow over in the care center. And her mind is still very alert, and so we talked about events of the past that related to her husband and I told her of one event that I remembered taking him downtown years ago when uh, one of his boys had enlisted in the Marine Corps, and he sent a telegram. And then when we got, got back in the car, and it was a little late at night, wasn't much traffic downtown in those days, late at night, that uh, we started riding along toward home, and he shed a few tears and wiped them out of his eyes. He was a very soft and sentimental person. Sometimes when I listened to him preach, I didn't get that idea. But on the other hand, down deep inside of his heart, there's a strong love for his wife, for his family, for his God. And that had everything to do with guiding him in the direction that he wanted to go. And that side of us need not be neglected. To love his word, to love his truth, to be true to ourselves and true to our God and true to his word. Not always an easy program, but it seems to me something we have to realize is really important if we're going to have the kind of unity that God wants us to have. We may never have it all together the way we want it, but let's don't give up the struggle for it. And to be working all the time that while being true to his word and true to ourselves and true to our God, that we're still striving for the bond of unity and peace and to love God and to love each other as much as we can. 
My time is up, so uh, I enjoyed being here these days with you in your lectureship program, and uh, so it's it's been a rich experience as far as I'm concerned.